talk to you about pricing. He's going to talk to you about the importance of pricing, how to do it properly. Put your hands together for Steve Major. Thank you, Steve. Now I better live up to that, <laughs> So, why is pricing important? Anybody want to give me a, an answer? Mm-hmm. And you have that? It's linked to your your revenue. Yeah, obvious, yes. <laughs> but some of these are obvious. Yeah, so that's fine. Pricing predicts profit, yeah. How important a variable in your business is price as opposed to cost, as opposed to anything else? What would you rank it as in its importance? Number one, it's been stated. I'm an accountant too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> number one, yeah, why is it, if it is number one, that it doesn't get our number one attention? It's one of the things that's hugely neglected in business, and that's why I think it's just so important that we need to be focusing on the pricing in our business, which is why I want to spend the next up until morning tea and then through to lunch, going through some of the tools, techniques, some of the ideas. Obviously we've got a diverse range of business people here. So there's different tools that apply for different businesses. So some of the tools as you, we go through it, might be 100% applicable for you, but just wait, it'll be one that definitely is. We'll go through some of the psychology of pricing. We'll go through some of how we need to, as a business owner, think about pricing, and then how we need to get into the shoes of our customer and think about what pricing is. There's a totally different perspective. At the end of uh, leading into lunch, I'll probably spend quite a bit on that, that last aspect of, about you and pricing. So it comes from all angles, and that's what we're going to, uh, to really focus on. So firstly, I know the print's not uh, overly big, but uh, just bear with me because I think this quote's very, very useful, very, very important for those of you that you know, let you read it. Warren Buffett said that if a business is a good business, basically you can go out tomorrow morning and raise your prices by 10% and not lose any customers. If you have to have a prayer session before you do so, then you have not got a great business. So in other words, we need to look at how to build the pricing power in our business. I'm not saying tomorrow morning or Monday morning that you go out and raise your prices necessarily by 10%. I might actually be saying to some of you it should be double instead of 10. But now the point is, is that we need to look at how we can build our pricing power so that we can have a business that we can raise our prices tomorrow if we want to. Not necessarily saying we should. Not necessarily saying it's a magic number of... 10%, 5%, 50%, whatever it is. But let's have a new way of looking at how important pricing is. So let's start with a little bit of an exercise. So why is popcorn expensive at the movies? I want you to think about that at every table and then I would like some answers. So if we could just have some thinking music just quickly. So I want you to think why is popcorn expensive? So I'll give you another 30 seconds. Okay. Thank you. Now, let's have some answers for this. Table down the back there. You're, you're stretching, but that sounded... But people will pay. Why will they pay? Because it's... Well, one of the things we see is it's traditional. Traditional. Tradition and habit. Habit. Right. What else? 
So, anything else on that table before we go on? So, we a theory. A theory, yeah. My theory is that the, tic the ticket prices are lower to make people come in and like, into their cinemas, but they um, raise the prices of the food, so they actually earn more profit. Okay, did everybody hear what Jaden just said? Yeah. Does anybody want to disagree? No. Right. Jaden, I think, deserves a round of applause. Anybody else want to contribute after Jaden's just stolen all the thunder? <laughs> <laughs> anybody else got any other ideas? Any other th theories? So You've got a captive audience. Captive audience. Sounds good. <laughs> Movie culture. So part of the experience, but you actually took it a little bit more than experience. You compared it, or use CF to mean compare, compared it to having at a home. I'll come back to that little point in a minute. Anybody else want to make any comment? Well, it's the only place you can buy it. It's the only place you buy it, okay? Somebody does buy it at home by the sound of it. No. <laughs> oh, I haven't, yeah. <laughs> that won't allow you in here. So in the, yeah. I noticed they're so confident about it how much it is. Yeah. There's another psychology going on in that, but I'll come to that a little bit later in the day, so make sure you remind me on that. Why there is no price on it. Um, so of the people here, who's willing to admit that they've bought popcorn at the movies? Whether it's for themselves or their children. Okay? <laughs> You're with me. <laughs> I hate the stuff, but I've got three kids that, that have over the years extracted enough out of me for popcorn, but I personally just can't stand it. So I am not a buyer. But let's return to Jaden, to what he said that there was a a structure for price for the tickets and a structure for the price for the popcorn. Because different customers self-select. And that's what, in essence, is going on. It's segmentation. It's not convenience. It's not captive audience. If captive audience was it, the price could be 50 times what it is now. But the reality is it isn't because it's a captive audience. It isn't because it's habit. That's an after result. It's not when setting the price. I'll come to experience in a minute because that's why experience allows the segmentation. But the reason why popcorn is expensive is because different customers are self-selecting. They're pricing the customer. It's a theme I'm going to keep coming back to. As much as, even though they're in a product business, they are pricing the customer. They know that some people will go in there just don't like popcorn, don't care about that experience, don't want to know if I went by myself, there's no one in the world to buy popcorn, but if I'm there with children in tow, well, I end up that being extracted. So different customers so are priced accordingly. It's all about segmentation. Some people often give the answer, it's about um, profit maximisation, and while price is obviously connected to profit, that's not what is how we set price, so that's an after result as well. Other people also talk about the rent, that if it's a leased premises and the rent, that therefore they need, that in essence, a cost structure. But nobody buys anything based on the cost. And I'll come to that theme back again. So we're gonna use popcorn a bit throughout the next couple of hours. But let's return this to this point about compared to home. I haven't had a coffee this morning, but um, I'm sure probably a lot of people have had coffees this morning. Possibly some of those of you who live locally may have had coffee at home before you came here. But you downstairs, the takeaway coffee is $4 a cup. Um, you can probably go to coffee shops nearby just here, and it's probably similar price, $3.80 to $4.50, depending upon the cup. 
And you go home and you, if you have instant, well, you're effectively paying about 50 cents a cup. But the interesting one is in the espresso machines. And it's this comparison that's going on. So Nespresso and now the, all the knockoffs, power in pricing is they shifted the comparison. We weren't, the Nespresso machines at home were not being compared to home coffee, which is mostly instant. They were being compared and are being compared to the coffee shop coffee, where you pay $4 to use a round number. And you're going, well, the pot at a dollar each is not that bad. Whereas if you compare it on a per kilo price, which nobody does except us accountants who know how to calculate it and uh, are into pricing, you work out that the espresso used to be around about $250 a kilo, which is just a little bit dearer than an Escafe Blend 43. But people were willing to pay because they shifted the comparison. So the popcorn, it never compared to the popcorn at home. It's just not, we don't stand there and go, how many, I don't even know what the current price of popcorn at cinema is, but you know, we don't make the comparison where we could get that for $1.50 and stick it in the microwave at home. We just do not make that comparison, right? And so all price, all price is contextual. If you want to write a little note, all prices are contextual. Always are, always will be, and it's the hardest thing for us as a business owner to constantly keep in mind. All prices are contextual. It does, we've got to look at what we're being compared to, and then we've got to look at how we can change the comparison, if we're able to change the comparison. And if we can change the comparison, we change our pricing position. Let's return to captive audience. I just want to cover on captive audience for a minute. If captive audience was the reason why, what price would popcorn be? Yeah. So, why isn't it twenty dollars? <laughs> yeah, so you create what's called a substitution effect. It's either we don't have popcorn, suddenly we'll have um, jelly beans or something, or we'll try to do the sneak something in because popcorn. So we create this captive audience can only work to a point because we create a comparison again. We're suddenly looking at, we're shifting the comparison. So it cannot be captive audience. It's one of the big misnomers are out there about captive audience. So to use another example, and right through the, you're gonna get a lot of pricing examples. So it's just how I try to help to connect the message. Here at this hotel, Wi-Fi in the room for a 24 hour period, it's $23.95. Pretty similar price to these sort of accommodation pretty well anywhere in the world. Roughly around about that $20 to $25. And they are really, really, really struggling to sell it anymore. And the reason why is a comparison. You know, most people automatically think the comparison might be the, the mobile device the iPad, the iPhone, or those who are on the other side of the fence, the Samsung. Um, that was just a little comment to Paul. Uh, but it's not the mobile device that we're comparing the Wi-Fi to. We're comparing it to being able to get it free at coffee shops. At so many coffee shops now, we can get it free. So suddenly, the $24 for 24 hour in the room seems horrendously expensive when if we go from get to buy a cup of coffee, we can get the Wi-Fi. And which the comparison. The irony is, I happen to know in the Australian context, most of the hotels are not making money at $24 for a 24 hour. It's, it's marginal margin in there. So from a cost point of view, they need to charge that. 
But the market doesn't care about costs. They're making a comparison. So we've always been compared. So we'll return to popcorn and how expensive it is at various parts of the of today. So let's just drill into the power of price in a bit more detail. I knew I'd put my clicker somewhere. It's not a pen. So, who determines how many pencils should be made in the world? Sounds a stupid question, doesn't it? Anybody want to start to try to work out who determines how many pencils are made? Somebody in whispered yeah. something. Yeah. Supply and demand. What, can we drill into supply and demand? Manufacturers. Manufacturers. Somebody said, I know the whisper, I wish I knew where they were, but whispered pass and answer. Um, what they, the amount they sold last year. Amount they sold last year. So what determines? Um, so there's no one person you would agree, yeah. right? But how many people would you think are involved in the manufacture of a pencil? I'm just talking a normal old pencil that kids use at school. We all use in the office or whatever at home. How many people do you think? Ten. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting close to the number. <laughs> so pencils have quite a, a process, and I won't go into the full process. I did this once as an exercise to, to find out exactly the full manufacture process of a pencil. But there are around about 80 different stages to get to the pencil that you uh, could use, for those of you who are using pencils as opposed to pens today, uh, on your desk. So what determines how many pencils are out there? Somebody said supply and demand. Somebody else said market. Price of lead. Price of lead. So is that from a cost point of view or? It's a uh, cost point. Um, yeah, just obviously it's a, it's a modern. So I suppose it's always going to have so cost pencils. We're always going to have stockpiles of pencils. Why are we always going to have stockpiles of pencils? Well, I'll just say that it's probably part of the market. I don't know, I've never seen a pencil shortage. <laughs> <laughs> Until the pen was invented, yeah. There's still millions and millions and millions of pencils sold every day in this world. Price! determines that, I was giving you an obvious answer to about there, but um, price determines it all the way through. So if, to use um, the gentleman there with the price of lead, if lead goes up, the manufacturer will not make, or that aspect of the manufacturer will not make or stay in business for long. They might for a little while as a loss scenario, but they'll need to get to a, a profit margin at some point. And if that pushes the end price too far, we will substitute pencils for pens or, or something else. So at the end of the day, it's the price that the customer is willing to pay for the pencil that dictates the whole chain all the way through, all the way to the, to the trees in Indonesia, where most pencils are coming from. All the way, price is dictating it. And it started with the price the customer is willing to pay for that end of end objective. It not started with what the costs were of the trees in Indonesia or, or the lead in the various parts of its graphite, but in various parts of the world. Um, or the prices of the different coatings that are put on it or the, the price of the manufacturer in Mexico where a lot of pencils are made. Um, they're made in groups of eight. Um, and they're, then they're cut into single units, um, and depending obviously on the pencil, whether erasers are put on them or not. But it started and ended with the price that the customer was willing to pay for the pencil 
all the way. Everything was dictated by that price. So to use the graphite example, the, the lead, um, if that manufacturer, its cost went up because there's a world shortage of graphite, just for portray that scenario at the minute. Um, so their costs go up. It's not an automatic that their price goes up because the next stage of production may just not be willing to pay for it. And that's when we might see, you know, instead of using graphite, they might use some other composition to, to create a pencil. Or alternatively, they'll look at, um, instead of selling pencils in manufacturing, we'll go into the pen market, you know, just being simplistic. But the point is, is the price dictates it, it so much. So why I use pencils is, there was a very famous economist uh, in the 1700s, Adam Smith, who wrote about the invisible hand in the market. And he called the invisible hand price. And he talked about how it dictated everything. But then we jump forward to in the 20th century to, to Soviet Russia. They had a person in Soviet Russia whose responsibility was to determine how many pencils that there were in Russia that were made. And the only place in the world that there was a pencil shortage was Russia. <laughs> because the market wasn't allowed to set the price, and guess what happened? They ran out of pencils, or didn't have enough pencils. Pencils became a valuable item because nobody would produce them at the price that that person dictated should be the price. So when the market gets interrupted, and the pencil case is quite a famous case in pricing um, because Russians gave us so much information to use there, um, price got out of whack. Suddenly there was a pencil shortage. So price has just got so much power that it's driving economies, it's driving our behavior every day, and we just uh, often just don't even quite realize what, it, what is happening in our business, what's happening in just our general uh, work in society of how price is having such a powerful impact. Even something as inane as pencils and how many pencils there are made tomorrow we determine by what price all of us are willing to pay for them in the supermarkets, in the office supplies in the next month, two months, three months, whatever. Price is dictating that. What price can be driven? And that's the power that's happening in your business as well. It's the price, both for good and for bad, is driving your business. We need to really harness the power that is actually there. Yeah, go for it. If the price uh, uh, is too low, then uh, is that the reason for not having enough stock? Is it just wasted? Is it wasted? Like in Russia, what was the reason? Nobody would produce it. So the Russians, because it was a command and control economy, um, nobody would, they said that the price, I can't remember how many ruples it was now, um, but they said we'll only buy pencils at this price and nobody would produce it for that price because there was no margin in it. So, so yeah, it was too low um, to happen. So the market fell over because the price wasn't viable. That's what business is all about. We react. And it mightn't be a, an instant reaction. But to use the example before of the cost of graphite going up, for argument's sake, it's not that it's going to be tomorrow morning that if graphite goes up that suddenly there will be no pencils or it'll be a whatever. It, it takes time to work through, but it will work its way through. And we'll either go, no, pencils are too dear, we're gonna use pens, or we're gonna use whatever else, or we'll go, yeah, I wanna use a pencil, and I'll pay the price. And, and that's how prices fluctuate. It's like, you go back probably th only three or four years, and the $24 for 24 hour Wi-Fi was seen as reasonable. Now, it's seen as horrendously expensive. And we're only talking a short period of time that that's transformed because as more and more coffee shops are getting free Wi-Fi all over the world, Starbucks in the States do it everywhere. So if you're in the States and you go, 
I'll stay um, here and I'll pay 24 dollars yeah. How can uh, coffee shops provide free Wi-Fi and hotels You're getting into a whole different <laughs> business model, really. You're getting into a different <laughs> business model. Um, you also got a different infrastructure, so the coffee shop only has a small, yeah. you know, a big coffee shop would be the area of this room, whereas the hotel, think of how many rooms, etc. even just here at the Novotel, I'm not sure how many rooms, but I'm on the eighth floor, so there's probably ten floors, I think. Um, so the infrastructure to do that is huge. The infrastructure to do it in a coffee shop that's the size of this room, you're talking a totally different to everyone. A coffee shop also knows, from a business attraction point of view, puts free Wi-Fi in, it gets a certain market that's just going to be there, and they're going to spend money. You're not going to stay at the Novotel because it's got free Wi-Fi. You know, whereas you'll go to the coffee shop because it's got free Wi-Fi. There's a couple of coffee shops near where I live. Um, I live in Brisbane, north side of Brisbane, Sanford. There's two coffee shops in Sanford. There's about eight coffee shops in Sanford. It's a little village. Um, two of them have got free Wi-Fi. They're the only two I go to. And it's because it's got free Wi-Fi. I can go there, take my Mac, sit there, do some work, check emails, whatever. So they get my coffee. So, so let's... The four Ps of marketing are as old as... I, don't know, I think I first written about in the 50s, might have even been earlier, the four Ps of marketing. But we, we know about product and place and, and promotion, and we spend so much of our time on those, and yet one of the other Ps of marketing is actually price. It's a marketing tool. We struggle to look at price in a marketing sense. but it's one of our big marketing tools. And just to uh, change tack for a minute, <coughs> if you've got any questions, please just throw them at me. Don't worry about you know, interrupting or whatever. That's fine. We want to make it. We're going to get some exercises in a little while, but uh, please throw the questions as I bring up issues. So price is a marketing tool. It is not just purely an operational business system or something. It is a marketing tool. We can use price to market our business. It's one of the powers of it is how important it is as a marketing tool. And when I say this, a lot of people automatically then think, yes, we can reduce price and that'll increase sales. That's the, the easiest view of price. And some businesses have been very, very good at that model. And they've gone the volume model. So in the US, Walmart has put their whole business model, has always been around driving price down. And as a result, a phenomenal business, but volume based, huge. Southwest Airlines um, in the US, a very cheap airline, but also got a great customer experience. JetBlue in the US, similar. Ryanair for all its stuff, it's quite a successful business. Price, low price, low price. Jetstar and the Australian equivalent. Go for the Tiger Air when it was around. Um, so forth, go for the low price, but they need volume to do it. Unless your business is a huge business, it's not the strategy I'm gonna talk about today. I want businesses to get to a premium position. And that's really what I'm focused on. I can tell you about how to get a lower price position and some of the things you've got to do, but I far prefer working on getting to a premium position where we're really using price as a premium marketing tool to drive growth that way, that we're getting, we might have fewer customers, we might sell fewer services, fewer products, but we're selling them at a much higher price, achieving a much higher margin, we've got a much higher profit in our business. So my aim, yeah, go, no? I'm in a business
Well, a little bit after the morning tea and that, we're go I'm going to have a couple of hot seats and I'm more than happy we can talk about in detail. I'm not going to rule out that you shouldn't change your price, even though you'd have to do the labels or whatever, but it's not necessarily that you should. There could be other ways as well of, um, without getting into a huge amount of detail in your business just yet, but there's other ways to get a premium price, even if it's not just the core. And I'll come to that in a minute as well, or probably after morning tea, actually. But um, there are more than one way to skin a cat. So I am positive that be able to get it out of. So the, the rest of what I'm going to be talking about is trying to increase your prices. So how do we set prices? How are people here setting their prices in their business? Do you want to give me some common ways people set their price? Uh, margin, somebody said. So in essence, you're saying, I work out my costs, and then I put X percentage on. And that's my price. Comparison with competitors. Okay, comparison with competitors. The person who said the cost plays, what industry are you in? Building. Building, yep. I guess that that might have been the case. Um, so competitors. Any other way? Value. 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 It was you who said that one. Yeah. Yeah. So, if I may, do you have uh, the billable hour in your accounting practice or not? No. No problem. Okay. We'll come back to value. Any other way? What we can get away with the customer? What you can get away with? I always love that one. Uh, it always I'm going to say uh, customer feedback. It's kind of slightly different. <laughs> increase in sales. Or increase, I suppose. People might uh, count for that. Um, customer feedback. If you get a customer tomorrow morning saying it's just too expensive, Monday morning, too expensive, do you react? If you get 10 customers saying that, do you react? Okay. Seasonal? Seasonal pricing? Business targets, a uh, profit target in essence, or a revenue target? <coughs> I should have written value down further. I don't want to write anything underneath it. <laughs> so we can do a survey to see if they get value out of their accounts. I think they outnumber us. <laughs> 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 so how do you work out value? You said it. <laughs> well, it's it, for us, we can the dollar value sometimes that we can add to the business uh -huh. the savings or you know, a number of things, but there, there's some type of dollar value yep. that is measurable. Mm -hmm. um, and the urgency sometimes has a bit more value. They need it done there and there has more value than they need. Okay. Yeah. The value to the market, what they're willing to pay for the value. So what they're willing to pay is another way of saying what you can get away with, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. yeah. It's probably just nicer wording than <laughs> what you can get away with. I thought we the value to the client as to how it's going to help that client and what it's going to potentially earn for that client. Yeah. So that they'd be willing to pay more for a service or a product that they are going to increase. 
Sally, can I get you to get a bottle of water for me, please? Um, what I like to do is It depends, yeah. On what? So if I'm in the middle of the Gibson Desert, I want water. How badly? It's men, yeah. So um, I'm covering them. I mean, you can see the green. Um, so why are we willing to buy water? when we're not in the middle of the Simpson Desert. Because it's marketed, it's healthy and fresh. Marketed, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> healthy, fresh, yeah. Comparison, Just easy. In comparison to another product, like the green, it's pretty cheap. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, no. If you get a power aid, it's four bucks, you get a water still. Okay, you've made, it was previous thing was comparison. You made a comparison at that time against Gatorade, Parade, whatever it was. In the room here, I had a bottle of Fiji water. And the price here was $6. I was at a restaurant on um, Surface Paradise um, in the Crown Plaza there on Surface Paradise. Um, and the revolving restaurant, and Fiji water there was seven dollars a bottle. Well, why are people willing to pay six and seven dollars for Fiji water? Really, what's the difference? <laughs> and it's a brand. It's still water. So value, Where, what is value? We're going to spend a bit of time on what is value, but I just want to start to see that, that water is such a great example. A perception, yeah. Value is always, always subjective. Even when us accountants can put a dollar value on it, it's not the only game in town numbers. It is always subjective. Price is always contextual and value is always subjective. So, there was a couple of us yesterday who were, it sounds a bit, in a way, as I said to them, it's a first world problem as we were talking. We were discussing about international travel between here and the States. And I recently just flew back from Dallas to Brisbane it's a 16 hour flight, 15 and a half, 16 hour flight. Um, and we were talking about the Dreamliner versus the A380 and so forth. And the comment was made, one of our speakers said, um, it wasn't me, said, it just needs to be quicker. They need to get faster planes. So from a value point of view to Nick, the speed between the US and Australia was very important. And as a frequent traveller, yes, we want shorter flights as possible. But I said, what about if they did it differently? If it was, you know, you went on there and instead of just sitting in a seat, even in premium economy and business or whatever, that are nicer seats, uh, still a seat that you sit there for an awful long time. And even if you do get up and walk around a little bit, it's still, there's not much happening. What happens if it was like a bit like, you know, you saw a movie in a, like a real cinema type effect and if there was a, even a little mini gym on board or stuff like that, suddenly would you care about the time? <laughs> Different value. Some people, the tourist travellers, not interested. They want it as cheap as possible. Some business travellers will go, yep, that's the value I'm after. It'll, 
don't care if it's 17 hours then from Dallas to Brisbane, you know, because it becomes an experience. Value is always subjective. So, um, Rory Sutherland is the head of Ogilvy in the UK advertising agency, and there's a great YouTube video um, where Rory um, is talking about this issue of value being subjective and price being contextual. And if you go back a couple of years ago, they were talking about investing a huge amount of money on the train between Heathrow and Paris, the Channel train, to speed it up by 11 minutes. And it was going to be, I think it's something like 1.5 billion euros to speed it up by 11 minutes. Different track changes, different train modifications, etc., to reduce that time by 11 minutes. And Rory goes on, he was at a speech in London, it was quite, I give him all the credit because it's a great example, I want to use it. Um, he goes, if you give me 200 million euro and I can solve it, that people will ask for the journey to go longer. And he said, my solution is to pay whatever's necessary, because in the scheme of it, it would be so minor in comparison, as long as you pay my 200 million euro fee, <laughs> and employ male and female supermodels to walk up and down the aisles. <laughs> And suddenly people wouldn't care about how long the journey was. The 11 minutes would disappear. Now it was a joke, but the point was is that you know, price is subjective, value is subjective, price is contextual. What well, are we comparing it to? It's a marketing tool. We need to use it as a marketing tool. So I just want to come on to another concept that drill into a little bit to explain just a, a shift that I think is happening. Well, not, I'm not the only one here thinking this is happening, but a shift that we've got to think about in our businesses, not just from the angle of price, but I'm going to take it from the angle of price. If we go back through the 1800s, 1900s, Everything in business was about getting economies of scale. Even small business was all about, in essence, the factory mindset. It was about how can we produce more output for a reduced cost. A whole business focus has been around this, getting more out the door for as little as possible so that we can sell more and have more margin. And Obviously, the, the true factories, the car manufacturers, the other, you know, the steelworks, all the rest of it, it's all been focused on this economies of scale. But even the same mindset has been at play in small business. That we've had a very heavy cost focus. We've had a very heavy efficiency focus in business. Everything has been directed at that so much effort has been put into having good systems around that. And I don't care whether you're the small one person business or you're the 1000 business. Steve's Dixon Clothing, the Fiji operation, so forth like that. It's that factory aspect. And it's not to say that's wrong in any way, shape or form. It's an appropriate and it has been an appropriate strategy. But things are moving that we've got to be mindful of that even in our little small business, it is no longer about economies of scale. Or it's no longer only about, might be a better way of putting it. So I'm an accountant. I used to have my own practice. I work a lot with accountants. And accountants, unfortunately, are hugely guilty of this. They create timesheet factories. that are selling time and how can they get the job more efficient. It's all most accountants unfortunately measure is efficiency in their own business or then. And even then, unfortunately, some accountants when they start advising businesses only measure efficiency in their clients' business. And efficiency is important. Obviously, we've got to have an efficient operation to be profitable. 
but things are moving with so much more information at our fingertips. It is now moving to the customer's side of the equation. Efficiency is the firm side, it's the internal. What we're moving to is the customer side, which is what we're moving to is scope. What can we do for our customer that we mightn't be able to have done in the past and we mightn't have thought about? How can we increase the scope of what we do? We might have fewer customers, we might not, but we might have fewer customers, but we're doing a lot more and we're collaborating with them a lot closer. And it's the scope of what we're doing than rather just the efficiency of what we can produce. What other product, service, or twist of product or service that we're doing now, can we deal with that customer that's going to have a much closer, tighter relationship? That's where things are moving at. It's moving into that economy of scope as the dominant driver of business, not just the economies of scale. So we talked about, well, briefly I mentioned Walmart before, of how they had a price strategy that's been hugely successful. In the last two years, strategically, Walmart are trying to move away from it. Now, they still want to have a super efficient, they've got probably one of the world's best supply chain operations. But they're now looking at how they can do more for their customers and how they, even the most, one of the most you know, efficient, cheap price, etc., businesses around is now going, in a strategic sense, what can we do more for our customer that's going to have actually a better margin? There's countless examples of it, but it's the, I reckon it's how technology is changing our relationship with how we deal with each other, how we interact with our suppliers, how we interact with our customers, how we interact customer to customer, is changing this, that it's now these economies of scope that we need to be looking at. Businesses for years have always been saying that the, the customer is, you know, the core, the customer is the centre. Well, finally now the customer has really got that power, more so than they've ever had. But it's this, what can we do? So even in the most inane products or services, we still can be looking at what else can we do? How can we increase the scope of what we do? And that was the example I was talking that there's other ways to look at than just the core product. What else might we be able to do with the people who are walking through the door and buying stuff off you? Right. I don't know the answer to that question, but the point is, is to start thinking in that sense. They're uh, coming to you for a reason. What else can I do? Is there other products? Is there other service? I don't know the answer specifically, but the point is, is to have this mindset of how can we change the scope of what we do for people, not just how can we change the efficiency of what we're good at? So it's not to say that no longer be efficient. It's not, don't interpret it that way at all. We still want to try to have an efficient business as best as possible, but have this focus that's now on the scope aspect. If we are focused on the scope of what we do, that's when we open up a pricing opportunity. Because some of our core products, we might be as this lady here is very limited in what she can do in the price on the core. But the other stuff will be totally different. So to use an accountant firm again, the core compliance, what I call the logic work in an accounting firm, not a lot of scope for, for price position. Particularly as more and more of it's going offshore. We're getting whole accounting firms. There's one substantial firm in Melbourne Four partner firm, we've got six or eight staff in Melbourne, and they've got 72 in India. The work's being done over there. So the logic work, the compliance work, they'll go on the McDonald's, the factory arm, good luck to them. Um, they'll make money, but I reckon they'll also have increased competition. But the magic work that an accounting firm can bring to their clients, that's where the, that's where the real money sits. And think of this logic magic in whatever business you are. The, the logic stuff will probably be go to the cheapest place. Steve's clothing to Fiji because it was much more efficient to do so. But there's other aspects of the magic stuff that is where the price position can sit. 
and that's where we need to look at in our business what that mix is. And if we're pricing the magic work in, in, in logic, that's when we lose the value of the magic work. Because it just gets priced as compared to what somebody else will pay and do it for. So we've got to really look at the scope of what we do. I'm not suggesting in that necessarily that suddenly we have a raft of extra services or extra products. It might be just telling the story differently of what we do. It might be just a repositioning. It might be that there are extra services or there might be just one extra service that changes how the whole business is positioned. But it's really thinking about what is happening in the custom as well. Who of you have bought the various chopped lettuce, various, those sort of chopped up already um, vegetables, pre-packaged in cellophane, etc. in yeah, supermarkets. Yep. The reason they were last year in 2012, the number one selling item in Woolworths in the fruit and veg area, right? Now, the idea that the, uh, the person who put that together and went to Woolworths, and it was first in Woolies before it came in Coles, um, the idea behind that, where do you think that would have made that a successful product? What do you think was driving it? Any ideas why that product has been successful? Convenience. Convenience. A bit more than that. Convenience is obviously a huge aspect. But what drove it? Sorry? Time management. Time management? Uh, so it's, it's going to be totally left field to you. So if we go back a couple of years prior to them hitting our shelves, the tendency was for a lot more takeaway and restaurant food. Right? And we've seen that drop, not huge, but enough. We've seen that trend to fall away a little bit, right? Hungry Jacks. <laughs> Hungry Jacks. Now, in the same period of time, you've seen the rise of cooking shows, Master Chef, etc., etc. Who cooks whatever? I don't know. I don't watch them, but um, there've been a massive rise on TV of those cooking shows of all shapes and sizes, from Jason Oliver through to a whole lot, right, all over. They've just been a massive rise of following of the cooking shows. So in other words, what we've done is we've driven people back to cook in the kitchens. And then we want convenience. But it drove, what was happening in society, what was changing perceptions, was away from, wasn't it? Yes, there was some of the health aspect, obviously, as part of it, but actually the huge driver was what was happening on TV. And that was where the idea came from. The bloke who put that together was looking at these cooking shows and going, I reckon I can make a dollar out of that, and connected convenient product to cooking shows. And uh, one of the, I can't remember which judge now, one of the judges of MasterChef was in the advertising campaign for it. So it was all about changing the scope of what they do, and, but it was just looking at what was changing in the lives of the customers, not just that looking at they already buy lettuce or they already buy whatever else of the vegetables, how can we make it more convenient? It wasn't that at all, it was going wider and going what's happening in the lives and then how can we serve that, how can we change that scope? So as we lead into morning tea, I want to finish on this point. A business only exists to serve a customer. Do you agree with that statement? Yes? So do you think every business practice that you have supports that then? So Kim yesterday was talking massively about the systems and Knowing Kim's business a little bit, I know that every system behind that is to support the customer. And I think it was a key point that Kim didn't 
And I said it to him last night, I said, you really should have reiterated that point that every system can't be from our internal focus only. It's got to support that statement. Sometimes we make things easy for us, but it's not necessarily easy for the customer. And when we're thinking about price, we need to always keep this in mind as well. The only reason we exist in a business is to serve a customer. It's simple words, so often stated, and I reckon, so often not thought about to the nth degree, to the real, what does that really mean? How would we make things easy for our customer? How would we, can we convey our price to our customer that they can connect with the value. How can we convey what we do and why we do it this way so that they understand how it adds value to them? How can we design our whole business around this aspect? Constantly be thinking about it. Peter Drucker wrote that in 1954, and I think it's probably one of the best statements. It's often quoted, the businesses who get it right get the premium positioning. Think about Apple. I know they're often cited, but you know they have, um, what is it, 25% of the smartphone market and 85% of the profit of the <coughs> smartphone market. Right? And it's because of that, everything is, the IT person might say Samsung's a better technical product. It may or may not be, I have no idea, but I love my iPhone. And I pay the price and I don't care because I like the relationship. So everything about the business, we must exist to serve a customer, everything. And importantly, what I'm talking about is price. So that brings us up to our break and I'll leave it to Steve, but any questions just before we go and then we'll get into some real tools and techniques after the morning tea. Yeah, all right, well, let's put our hands together. Quickly, first up to Steve. Um, the beauty about listening to Steve again, and it just triggered something that I learned from you 12 or so months ago, was just that. How do I add more value to my client, to my customers? Once again, it was just one pebble out of all those things you spoke about this morning that just dropped in that pond that's now created a ripple in my mind again. I knew it, I'd forgotten it. It's now another reminder to me, how do I add more value to my customers? So. You know, we are not, we're going to learn so many things from over these two days. How many things do we need to really take away? One, two, three. But that one for me was gold. It's now triggered and increased my awareness again of adding value because businesses exist to serve the customer. I've forgotten. Good reminder. So um, any questions for Steve before we go and have our half an hour break? Or are we just going to sit tight? We're gonna have another hour after uh, after morning tea. Um, yep, yeah. you guys happy with that? You don't want to ask anything just now? I'll just put it out there. Um, like in my position, and I'm pretty well just kind of starting off. Um, I think that the biggest thing is that when you think about the business, you need to start a business. Okay. <laughs> If you've got the guts, go for it and set it as a premium price. From day one, it's the easiest than having to increase price. Trouble is, I appreciate you've got to cash flow yourself, you've got to get through, and it's a gutsy, gutsy move, right? Um, but if you're willing to have a crack at it, it's by far and away the best. Go whatever's in the market out there and then throw 30% on top of it. Because what I'm going to talk about a concept is price drives value. Right, so if you go that, you know, I don't, what business are you in, sorry? Okay, so, I don't know, I'm just going to take another industry because I don't know enough about that, but just say accounting, because they're easy. Um, <laughs> and for a certain service, it's five grand for accountants, is what pretty well the competition are talking about. And they go, how can I charge 10? And if I can answer that question and understand how I can communicate the value and deliver the value, then you're away because your margin's going to be so much more than your competition. So you're going to have much more profitable. Price will drive value, and I'll go into that a little bit further. But so if you've got the cash flow to get 
as you're building that story, you go for it. No, I do appreciate there is the balance. You've got to yeah, cash yourself. Yeah. So it's really about knowing where the market is, first of all. When you're going to and then the how market. to work out how you can do it differently and better. Because if all you're doing is the same as everybody else, well, people are going to make the comparison and go, well, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. well, each bit cheaper, right? But if you can go, I do it this way because of X, Y, Z, then go, it's worth twice, three times, whatever, then you'll get the twice, three times. I'd like to think that everybody in this room, because we are in this room, is ballsy enough to go, that's where it's at, we're going to jack it up, and we're going to learn enough stuff in here to substantiate where the value is. Because everybody else are not in this room, are they? When, 90% of people don't learn. They just have their level of knowledge and they'll flow through and learn through experience. We're trying to accelerate but by sitting here and say we want to learn quicker than that. We're not just going to float along. So I reckon, yeah, different strategies, but... All right, let's have a break. We're going to be back in the room at 11 o'clock. We're going to...